Hi, welcome. My name is Martina Hoogman. I'm an assistant professor of the Radboud University Medical Center in Nijmegen, the Netherlands. I'm one of the two chairs of the Enigma ADHD Working Group. This is a worldwide collaborative to study the neurobiology of ADHD. I'm happy to introduce the topic of ADHD to you in the next slides for Enigma U. Maybe you already know a little bit about ADHD. Can you tell me which of these symptoms is not a symptom of ADHD? B is not a symptom of ADHD. A makes careless mistakes, lacks attention to detail. C is forgetful and daily activities are both symptoms of ADHD. To get familiar with ADHD, I will present some random facts about ADHD. Despite what most of us think, ADHD has been around for quite some time. ADHD had been documented in the 18th century already. Although it was not called ADHD at the time. In the past, several different names have been used to refer to ADHD, such as hyperkinetic disorder and minimal brain dysfunction. ADHD is more prevalent in boys than in girls. However, when we look at the adult prevalence, we see that the prevalence becomes more equal between men and women. The worldwide prevalence of ADHD is estimated at almost 6% in children and 2.5% in adults. However, this differs between countries. In this introduction, the following topics will be addressed the clinical aspects of ADHD, the etiology, and a little bit about recent discussions about neurodiversity. Well, what is ADHD exactly? It is a neurodevelopmental condition characterized by symptoms of hyperactivity, impulsivity, and difficulties concentrating that do not match the developmental stage. They also have to be present for at least six months. The behavioral symptoms have to be present in different settings, such as at home, at school, or at work, not just in one single setting. The symptoms also need to cause impairments. This is an important criterion. If there are no impairments, there is no diagnosis. ADHD is classified as a condition that is emerging during development. Therefore, symptoms need to be present before the age of 12. And finally, no other disorder better explains the symptoms. Well, as indicated before, the identification of ADHD symptoms plays a prominent role in the diagnosis of ADHD. Here is a list of these symptoms. There are nine symptoms that belong to the category of inattention. The other category consists of six symptoms of hyperactivity and three of impulsivity. Diagnosis does not mean all symptoms have to be present. For children, six symptoms in one category are needed for a diagnosis, and for adults, five symptoms. However, most people with ADHD have symptoms in both categories. If you want to get more familiar with the individual symptoms, please pause the video to read them all. Diagnosing ADHD is not easy. Preferably, an experienced clinician is involved in a diagnostic process. It is sometimes hard to judge the severity of the symptoms and the impairments that it causes. A diagnosis can only be made through the use of semi-structured interviews. This interview contains questions about all the symptoms listed at the previous slide. Despite many efforts from scientists to find a biomarker for ADHD, none has been found. An additional difficulty for getting a diagnosis in adults is that they need to retrospectively decide whether symptoms were present before the age of 12. This is usually done through interviewing the parents or going through old school reports. We all are impulsive or hyperactive sometimes. We also all experience difficulties with concentrating. Some people display these traits or symptoms more than others. This is 
what is depicted here in the figure. An ADHD diagnosis is considered to be at the extreme end of this distribution. People with ADHD are all different. This has to do with the 18 symptoms and the different combinations of the symptoms that are possible. People with ADHD are at risk of having additional psychiatric or mental conditions, such as addiction or depression. But not all people with ADHD have them. So this is another factor that introduces heterogeneity in the sample. Also for the etiology of ADHD, there is heterogeneity. I will touch that subject later. People with ADHD might seek help and there are different treatment options. There is pharmacological treatment with different options. Research has shown that medication reduces symptoms in ADHD. There are also non-pharmacological treatment options, such as behavioral and cognitive therapy, neurofeedback training, diets, mindfulness. Research on the effects of these treatments are not conclusive and therefore individual approaches are needed when deciding the right treatment. ADHD can be a serious condition. This overview shows the impact and consequences of ADHD across the lifespan. The different colors represent different types of consequences. For example, health and psychiatric comorbidities in light red and social problems such as divorce in blue, psychological consequences such as uh, suicide attempts in purple, academic and occupational problems in green, and risky behaviors such as car accidents in yellow. Please pause again the video to look at the figure more closely if you want. In this second part of the introduction to ADHD, I want to briefly touch the topic of etiology of ADHD. ADHD is often present in families. This is due to the heritable nature of ADHD. Here you can see an overview of the heritability estimates per psychiatric condition. With 74%, heritability estimates are relatively high for ADHD. There is not one single gene that causes ADHD. It is not even only genetic factors that cause ADHD. It is the combination of multiple genetic factors and environmental factors that increase the risk of developing ADHD. We also have learned that per individual with ADHD, there could be different genetic and environmental factors that increase the risk of having ADHD. So it's really a complicated picture. On this slide, you can find examples of environmental factors that have shown to increase the risk for developing ADHD. This slide comes from ADHDevidence.org, a great source for evidence-based information about ADHD. You can see here that at different stages of development from prenatal, for example, maternal stress, to postnatal and early, developmental, early development, of poverty or vitamin D deficiency, there are risk factors associated with ADHD. Then the third part of the introduction to ADHD is about neurodiversity. Recently, the neurodiversity concept has gained attention in the context of neurodevelopmental conditions such as autism and ADHD. This concept was first introduced by Judy Singer in 1990 and deviates from the medical model of ADHD that focuses on deficits and treatment. Neurodiversity is about viewing neurodevelopmental conditions as normal variations in the brain. People with these features may also have strengths. This links to wishes of people with ADHD who do not want to be cured of their ADHD because it also has advantages but rather want to embrace the differences and help them accommodating the differences. The research field of studying positive aspects in ADHD is still immature, but for example, research in creativity and ADHD shows a positive link between the two for a specific aspect of creativity. Other studies who have investigated strengths in ADHD more broadly show multiple self-reported positive aspects of ADHD, such as being pro-social, 
having a positive attitude and being flexible and open. Future research will have to determine the role of these aspects in the characterization of ADHD. And with this, I would like to end the introduction to ADHD. More evidence-based information can be found here. Thank you for tuning in.